uh, you know what I think I need to go with my costume? And no, not a psyche valve. Um, I, I think I need like a big long skirt piece of hay sticking out of my mouth, and so that'll be fun. Anyhow, um, I got this. Um, Helen is um, having some complications from uh, some surgery she had on her leg, and so she's staying home, and we need to pray for her. Also, Melody Allen had her surgery on Tuesday, I believe it was, and um, she's doing okay. She's had some ups and downs, as you'd expect from surgery. Um, we're going to pray for them right now, but we're also going to pray for uh, our brothers and sisters who aren't meeting in church because Florence ran them out. And, uh, yes? Okay. What's your sister's name? Shana. Shana. All right. So just join me in prayer, if you would, as we start. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for, <coughs> for being our friend. For being someone, Lord, who we can come to. Because, Lord, there's a lot of people that we love that are hurting. Helen and Melody Allen are at the top of our list because of how close they are. Shane is going into surgery. But, oh, Lord, my heart is broken. So many. I read that there are two million people almost who have been displaced because of the hurricane. Many of them would have rather been in the church this morning near their home worshiping you but have had to flee. Father, we ask. We ask, Lord, that you would pour out a blessing on them. It is amazing and triumphant. And they will tell stories of the greatness of our God. Because of the healing and the great things that he has done. We ask in Christ's name. So we've come to the end of Philippians. And, and I'm, I'm kind of sad because I've absolutely loved going through Philippians and it's just been a lot of fun. And so the last thing that Paul covers is the idea that joy demands contentment. And, and I know I spend a lot of time talking about the, one of the biggest problems is that we are far too content in America as a church. And that is why we struggle. And so when I talk about contentment, I, I, I want to be clear to define that there are two kinds of ways to be content. And most people are not content, and they try to find contentment through money, power, prestige, relationships, career, possessions. They try to find contentment in everything outside of them that this world has to offer. They try to find it in things that are passing and fleeting and can't possibly give to them what they truly need. And so they struggle to attain more. They struggle thinking, if only, if only I could do just a little more. If only I had just a little more. As a matter of fact, there was a survey done a few years ago. And they asked people from every age group and from every political place on the spectrum. Well, not political, economic place on the spectrum. How much money is enough? And they were expecting people to say $100,000 a year or $150,000 a year. The number one answer, 80% of the people answered with this one answer from every economic bracket, just a little more. 
Because we always think if I had just a little more, then all of a sudden everything in life would change. If I had just a little more, then I would be, I would be able to be free from difficulty. And really that's what people want when they talk about contentment. What they're looking for in life is to be free from difficulty. They think, if only I had more of this, if only I had more of that, if only I could do this, if only I could do that, then I would be free from difficulty, as if that is somehow possibly attainable. And that's why I love what Jeremiah Burroughs said. He said, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit in God's wise, which freely submits submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal of every condition. He says, contentment has nothing to do with all of the circumstances in your life, only how you view the circumstances of your life. And that is what Paul is getting at. Paul says, if you want joy in your life, you need to be content with the things of life. But the place he never wants to be content is in his pursuit of a relationship with his Lord Jesus Christ. Open up with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We are going to finish the book of Philippians today. So sad. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul begins by saying a a contented person is confident in God's providence. Paul said, here I am, I'm sitting in prison, and, and I know that you have been waiting for opportunities to reach out and to serve and to minister to me, and now you have the opportunity, and I praise the Lord for it. I rejoice that I'm here where I'm at because it means that now you have the opportunity to minister to me in a way that you would never have before if I had not been here in prison. And Paul says it out of complete sincerity. I mean, most of us would think, oh, great, I'm in prison. I'm so glad now you have a chance to minister. But not Paul. See, Paul understands that the circumstances of life are oftentimes at God's disposal in how He needs to use us. In the things that He wants to do through us. That's why the definition that that Jeremiah Burroughs gave of, of contentment is so important. Because it it demands that we understand that our lives belong completely to God. It demands that we understand that God can use us how He needs to use us and we can be content with it. It it, It means that we're okay if God says, I want you to minister in the desert. I'm going to send you to this place called 29 Palms where the sun shines all the time and where the heat is unbearable and the water is sparse. And he said, Lord, that's where you need me, that's where I go. And I know that's a hard thing for a lot of our military personnel when they come and they wind up here, they're like, Lord, you set me here. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and they're like, yeah, we drove in at night and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So this is, yep, I drove in at night. And then you wake up in the morning and you're like, is there another part of this town that doesn't look like this? Contentment says, 
I understand that I am a pawn in this huge, amazing chess set that God has and that He's playing and He's using my life for the betterment of His kingdom. And sometimes God places me in places that I really want to be and doing things I really want to do and sometimes He places me in a spot where I have to do things I don't want to do and I have to deal with people I don't want to deal with. And Lord, no matter what it is, no matter how you are using me, I'm going to praise you and rejoice in you for it. That is what it means to be content. And don't get me wrong, contentment is not easy to find. Paul goes on to talk about how contentment is completely independent of circumstances. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul says, I understand that the contentment I have has nothing to do with the situation and circumstances of my life. It has nothing to do with how much food I get to eat, the kind of foods I get to eat. It has nothing to do with my job. It has nothing to do with the money I have. It has nothing to do with the relationships that are around me. It has nothing to do with anything that demands circumstances. And you see, this is where we struggle with contentment. This is where we really struggle with understanding the depth of what contentment is. Because especially as we grow older, and we get older and older, we remember the things that we could do when we were younger. And we think, man, if only I was younger again. And then we think about other times of life, and we think, if only this again, if only this again, if only this or if only I had this. And we, we begin to think about all the things that could possibly bring happiness to us. And we think, if I only had those things, I could be content. And Paul is trying to teach us that none of those things bring contentment in life. As a matter of fact, they bring the exact opposite. All you have to do is spend time with a rich person to know that the acquisition of money and, and property and toys does not bring contentment because they are seeking more. And often the more you have, the more debt you acquire trying to gain more, thinking that all of those things are possible if I just have something different. Because we try to find contentment in life outside of its source. Contentment, though, is found in the Lord and the Lord only. So Paul writes, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Now when he talks about being able to do everything, he doesn't talk about He doesn't talk about being able to do anything he wants to physically. He doesn't talk about being able to attain to certain levels of education. He doesn't talk about being able to do any job that is available or, or lift any amount of weight. He doesn't talk about those things. Because the strength of the Lord is not in those things. And that's what Isaiah was getting at when he said... He who gives strength, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and the young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. He's not talking about physical things. He's talking about hope in the Lord. 
that gives us determination to succeed. That gives us perseverance. When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, what he's referring to is overcoming every obstacle that Satan puts in our path. What he's talking about is being able to overcome the difficulties of life. Not that life won't be difficult. Life will always be difficult. Life will always be hard. There is never a promise that life will be easy. There is never a promise that life will be worry-free. There's only the command to live worry-free. Because we can't solve everything. We can't fix everything. And I know Jim would probably want to argue with that because he's almost tried to fix everything and succeeded in fixing almost everything he's put his hands to. But those are the things of the world. And the thing about fixing your automobile, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but it breaks down again. My daughter's learning that. She keeps calling me. She's like, Dad, my car is making this noise. And I keep saying, Honey, when was the last time you saw me successfully fix a car? She's like, I don't know that I've ever seen that, Dad. And I was like, Why do you keep calling me? I don't know. Call your uncle. He fixes cars. Life is always difficult. That is the one promise that you can count on. Jesus said, if it was difficult for me, it would be difficult for you. If they didn't like me, they wouldn't like you. He said, you will be tempted. You will struggle. James says, the storms of life will come. And a double-minded man will be tossed about by the waves of life. But a single-minded person will be an anchor who is not moved because he's latched on to Jesus Christ. The one area in life that we are never to be content is in our pursuit of Jesus Christ. desire Him, to latch on to Him, to be moved by Him, and to be who He needs us to be. The most amazing thing was said in Acts of David. So he was a man who fulfilled God's purpose for him. Could a greater thing be said of you? Could a greater thing be said of anybody? See, that is what brings contentment. I am exactly where God needs me to be for this season He needs me. I'm doing exactly what God needs me to do during this season He needs me. Some days, some seasons, that season is battle. I'm out fighting the fight. But after fighting the fight, soldiers come back for healing of their wounds before they're sent back out. And so some seasons, the Lord has us in a hospital being treated so that we can grow strong and go back. There are seasons of life and they go up and down and that is where the Lord needs us at different seasons. He needs us to be okay with where He sends us and what He's doing. Because when we are content, we 
beauty about contented people. Because a contented person is concerned about others. A contented person is free to be concerned about others. Paul says, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphrodite the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he ends with this real quick. He says, Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Which I love the saints in Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Paul says, Paul says, contented people care about others. And he didn't use himself as an example. He said, you are contented people who are deeply concerned about others. And it was important that Paul cuts that in because, you know, Paul's like, hey, thanks for the gift. By the way, just so you know, I'm content whether I have a lot or a little as if I didn't need your gift. But then Paul says, but I understand that contented people are concerned about the needs of others. Content people are free to care about other people. And so Paul said, you cared about me. You gave of yourself because you care about me. The people of Philippi were rather poor. They didn't have great riches. And so they gave out of their pocket. And when they gave, that normally meant they went without. But they were free to go without because they understood that they were exactly where God had them. They weren't in pursuit of more materials. They weren't in pursuit of greater posterity. They didn't want everyone to know their name. They didn't want to be rich for the things of this world. They wanted to get by. Because in getting by, they had a great victory. Concern for those around you begins with contentment. If I'm not okay with where I'm at, if I'm not okay with what's going on in my life, then I am fighting with everyone around me to try to find it. Believing that if I can just step over one more person, I can have something I didn't have before. Thinking that if I can attain to the next level, then I can have something I didn't have before. You see, contentment begins with walking arm in arm with Jesus. That's why we're called to hunger and thirst for righteousness. There's a lot of things in life to not be content. I hope 
you are not content with the ministry of this church. I hope you are not content with the lives that are out there that we have touched and ministered to. I hope you're not content with the depth to which we share fellowship. The size of our building, that's fine. The color of our pews, that's fine. But the impact we make for Jesus Christ is something we should never be content with. The depth of our fellowship in Jesus Christ is something we should never be content with. And I know I ride in on a stick pony and some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, someone must have spiked his communion juice this morning because he fell off his rocker. You know what? I am not content with the impact that we make for Jesus. And I hope that you will be so discontented with it that you will do something wacky and crazy and join me. And I know it's probably the weirdest thing you've had to do in 15 years. But I promise I will try to talk it. I promise I will try to come up with ideas that are even weirder and more bizarre. Not for the sake of just being strange, but for the sake of having fun. Because man, if we can't express our joy through silliness, then we're missing. Then we're missing out. my challenge to you is what are you content with today? And what are you not content with? I want to challenge you to make a list in honesty. And you know what? There are days where I'm not content with my financial status. There are days where I think, man, if only I had more, everything would be okay. And normally those are the days I remember that I forgot to walk closely with Jesus on that day. Let's be committed to being everything for Jesus. Invite, to invest, to involve, and to impact. And maybe you think there's no way I'll ride a stick pony and find a kid. Find a kid in the neighborhood and say, hey, our church is doing us. Going to be part of the parade. I want to walk with you. Want to ride a stick pony. Kids will do it. Hey, you get to give out a bunch of candy. Third. Let's invite, to invest, let's involve, let's impact our community for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close today, Lord, this is our heart. Father, may we have a renewed fire and passion for you. Not for the sake of creating a name, but Lord, for the sake of growing your kingdom. And Lord, may our contentness in you with the things that you've given us in life be displayed by our concern for others. And may we love them ways they've never been loved before. 
we ask in Christ. Amen.